Hi, Doug. Uh, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Doug, thank you very much for giving us your very important and very precious time. And I really know that how busy you are and how much it is important for all of us that you have, uh, you are going to share your experience and your knowledge on spiritual care. So I am uh, sure that our participant will get a lot of benefit from you. And our organizers are also very appreciative to you. And they are also looking forward to listen to your, uh, your talk, your discussion. So uh, first of all, I want to uh, ask you to, if you want to give any uh, very brief message to our participants on this very important international course that they have organized. Sure. Well, uh, just to say um, salam and darud, darud to all our friends in Persia, happy to uh, be participating in this event uh, as the education continues with Dr. Nazir Zaidi. Uh, Nazir has done a great job of bringing his uh, Islamic uh, studies uh, into an integration with spiritual care so that he is able to join the two together and uh, help people to understand the applications. And this is very similar to what has happened into uh, the other Abrahamic traditions of Judaism and Christianity, where clinical pastoral education, spiritual care was a blending of the religion with the spiritual care understandings that came from both spiritual traditions and psychological traditions. So I'm very happy to see Nazir uh, bringing this work uh, to the Persian uh, medical community, nursing community, and allied health community. Um, and also their own initiative uh, that from the Mashhad University of Medical Sciences. So they also worked hard for this one. And if they were not prepared for this one, so this would not be able to like materialize so I think that it is also very important that they took this initiative and then a lot of hard working was required for this one. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm happy to be speaking to people in both the city of Tehran and the city of Mashhad. I know they are both great cities of Persia. Thank you so much. Doug, my first question is that you uh, just wanted to know the importance of clinical pastoral education, uh, because uh, you are going to talk to someone, those who don't have any experience or much understanding about CPE, clinical pastoral education, and uh, those who are providing spiritual care without getting this experience and this education. So how you see the difference between uh, those who are experts and those who have completed clinical pastoral education and those who are providing spiritual care without getting this experience and education? Well, you know, it's a difficult comparison in some respects because if you compare it uh, on a professional level, you would have to compare the difference between residents um, and interns and uh, fully skilled general practitioners and specialists, for example, in the medical field. However, if you look at the uh, field of religious uh, studies, religious education, uh, persons who are either imams or who are uh, ministers or priests in various different religious traditions, they bring something of their own too. So it really depends upon the person a lot as to how much benefit they can take from the education and how early, but there are definitely degrees of ability like anything else as you study it uh, more. So I think we see many instances where someone comes to us who has years of experience in the parish that is in the church or in a temple or mosque or their background is, is uh, from one of those different uh, religious groups and they're a leader in that group. But as they take our training in clinical pastoral education, a great transformation takes place. And they themselves report that they wish they had this education for working with their own people in the parish. 
uh, when they started off. And some denominations require that actually, even for parish ministry. But for the hospital setting uh, or for prison settings or other specialized settings like addictions and treatment centers, the difference is really enormous. Uh, so um, that my second question is, uh, we know that one of the very important competencies uh, in spiritual care is uh, assessment. If we are perfect in making our assessment, then we will be able to successfully provide spiritual care. So I just wanted to know because our uh, in our participants, so we have uh, medical doctors, we have nurses who are not going to, uh, not willing to become uh, expert in spiritual care or specialization. They are not going to get this one. But as a doctor, as a uh, as a nurse, or as a uh, healthcare professional, they also need to provide to some extent spiritual care there and they need to pay attention to this aspect as well. So uh, how you uh, will tell us and explain to us um, the difference between assessment and uh, screening and how you, what message you want to give to those who are not in the area or field of spiritual, spiritual care, but they are medical doctors, they are nurses, and they have some other healthcare uh, related professions. Sure. Well, I, I, we talk about two different things. We talk about screening and we talk about assessment. And most of uh, the healthcare professions would understand those terms, I think, once they're translated into Farsi. So um, in screening, uh, we're looking at nurses or physicians or allied health workers uh, to be able to recognize the signs of what we would call spiritual distress. So the first thing is to be able to notice, just like with physical distress, that the patient is in discomfort, notice that the patient is in discomfort spiritually. And to do that, one needs to be uh, sensitive to the human being more than just a body, more than just a brain, and more than just a mind. I mean, we know now that there are neurons in the gut, as well as in the heart, not only in the brain. So even scientific biology is teaching us to pay attention to these subtleties of the human spirit that exists. So for that purpose of screening, I think people really start to look, need to look at the emotions, uh, happiness, sadness, gladness, and fear, and say, how much of each is seemingly expressed by this person? That's your first tip. And, and another thing is to pay attention to their, their signs of their body. Are they looking uh, like they are sad, even if they're not saying they're sad, or are they looking angry even if they're not saying that they're angry and to be attentive to these human dimensions that express themselves in both the emotions and the feelings so a feeling would be more like hopelessness or helplessness that might not show up until you did an assessment but in the screening you can probably see that the person is angry or fearful or sad so paying attention to these basic things is the first step to understanding that the physical that's the biological physical part needs to go along with the psychological part and the spiritual part, and they all overlap. So it may not be expressed in religious language at all, and yet that person is experiencing a form of despair or despondency or some kind of hopelessness or helplessness. And your tip in the screening is that just something seems wrong with them on that level. And then the spiritual care practitioner can go into deeper depths of looking at just exactly what is the origin of that, how much is coming from one particular issue, how much of it is coming from another particular issue, and just what would we do in order to be able to approach this person with some kind of intervention or support that they would need in accordance with the degree and the level of distress and where it's coming from, how much of it is based in the present crisis of illness, how much of it is based or already existed, ideologically speaking, prior to their admission to the hospital. Uh, so, for, for example, if they have uh, made screening and they uh, understood the spiritual aspect, maybe patient is angry, maybe in distress, maybe anxious, maybe uh, uh, fear or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if someone is medical doctor or even nurse, so what do you suggest? What exactly, how they need to intervene and uh, at this level, what they need to do? And they also have very little time because they have to 
pay attention to other aspects which are more medical, not spiritual. So how you uh, just give this message or let us know what they need to do? Yeah, so now we're talking about support or interventions. Now, you know, here at Vancouver General Hospital, the first thing that comes to my mind, of course, is for them to make a referral when they notice that there's a significant spiritual distress to make refer to a spiritual care practitioner. If that is not possible, because there are none, uh, then one has to do limitedly what one can. And so the first thing I think for a nurse or an allied health practitioner or a doctor is to realize the power that they have. There's an enormous amount of power that physicians and other healthcare workers, but especially physicians have in the power of their words so if, for example, you have an extremely anxious patient and the doctor doesn't want to give false hope by saying, oh, everything will be fine. Nevertheless, that doctor can come into the room, look at the patient and say, you know, I think that you have a very good fighting chance of getting through this. It would be wonderful if we could join together cooperatively for your health care to give you the best chance possible or something to that effect because we've all experienced the difference between a doctor who is really nervous, who has an anxious presence, and one who does not have an anxious presence. And I'm not talking about the confidence that would be arrogance. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the confidence that comes from experience and also the realization, even if you're a young doctor, of the power of your words to either encourage a placebo or a nocebo effect on that person. So knowing the power of your words is absolutely critical. That's the very first thing. And then looking at the person as a human being, recognizing that hospitalization is a very difficult thing. Perhaps the healthcare provider has never been hospitalized themselves. Uh, once you've been hospitalized yourself, you fairly quickly realize the crisis of illness uh, as it is experienced by the patient is very subjective, not just objective. So how are they interpreting these things? So some simple questions about how are you experiencing your illness? Or here's a good one for a surgeon. And I, I, I remember a surgeon who used to use this. If your wound, if your surgical wound could talk, what would it say to me? What would it say to me? To help to give the person a chance to simply express some of that which is on their heart or in their gut and to let them thereby experience some catharsis from getting it off their chest, so to speak, it's English expression, getting something off your chest. You probably have it in Farsi too. And through that experience of sharing some of their feeling and experiencing that confidence that the physician and the nurse and the allied health are here in a team model to support me and that we need to work together and that they are confident that they are going to do everything they can and give them that sense that, you know what? we can get through this together. You don't have to give them an exact specific as to what will happen in order to give hope. Hope was the number one thing when they asked psychiatric patients, for example, what they wanted, hope more than anything else. And when the Mayo Clinic did a survey of patients, general patients in medicine and surgery, et cetera, when they had critical care, when they looked at that and they asked, what do you want most in a doctor? And, and what do people generally want most in a doctor? It came down to one word. It was amazing. That yeah. one word was kindness. Kindness is a thing that people want more than anything else. They want a competent doctor, but they want kindness. They want that human connection, that imago day to imago day, the soul to the soul. They want to know that you're, you care and that you're really going to try to heal them, to help them heal themselves. And that, I think, that is the most important thing, is it? Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, about uh, another very important uh, issue and then topic in spiritual care, especially when we are getting this clinical pastoral education and we are uh, giving uh, education and training to uh, our students. Uh, the issue of self-awareness. Uh, I know the Iranian culture, I studied there, and I have understanding that they know uh, self-awareness and they know the importance of self-awareness, but this is mostly from moral and ethical perspective. For example, we need to know our deficiencies. We need to know our shortcomings. If we know our problems, our difficulties, our shortcomings and our immoralities and impurities, 
then we will be in a position to address our problems. And if we don't know ourselves, what's going on within ourselves, then we will not be able to address. So this is mostly moral and ethical side. I would like to know about uh, this self-awareness, how much it is important for spiritual care provider to have this uh, self-awareness in his or her work. So, so first of all, I just want to say that the video here said that there was a problem with my microphone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. So um, there's really two different things here. If you're a spiritual care practitioner, if you've been trained in clinical pastoral education, uh, that's one thing. If you're not, well, that's another. So you cannot expect the same degree of self-awareness uh, and especially an understanding of how to use your self-awareness with a patient uh, you can't expect the same level of it from a nurse or a physician, uh, just like you can't expect the same understanding of how to use medications from a spiritual care practitioner. So there is a difference um, for the persons in uh, Mashhad or, or in Tehran right now who are not spiritual care practitioners. I think self-awareness has to come through either your workshops or something, or, or perhaps they are studying in a, a, a spiritual way in some other respect, uh, different aspects that have to do with learning about the self, because here's the thing. When we walk into a room, uh, we bring ourselves in. So if you're a doctor and you come into the room with your prescription pad, okay, but remember that you first of all bringing yourself in. You are the major tool. You're the number one tool. We know this in spiritual care because we are the only tool. We don't have a prescription pad. We don't have a scalpel. We don't have an IV. We don't have anything other than ourselves. And so we try to present ourselves as one person made in the image of God with another person made in the image of God. And here's the thing about the image. It's like a mirror. It's like two mirrors facing each other. And if my mirror is clear enough, then I will be able to get that reflection, that refraction between the mirrors that goes like this, which creates sort of a horizontal transcendence, which is kind of like experiencing God in each other in some way, shape or form based upon the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic teachings of being made in the image of God. So when you experience that soul-to-soul -soul connection, it's very powerful. But if my mirror is full of dirt, because I'm so full of my own pride or whatever it is, then my reflection is not very good. So I need to be able to clean that mirror. And self-reflection is really cleaning the mirror so that I'm aware of my trigger points, my buttons that get pushed. This woman may remind me of my mother and I, I just can't bear her suffering. So I can't really be there with her the way I'd like to. Or this one reminds me of a bully that I had when I was a kid and I wanna run out of the room when I'm with them. There are many, many subtle, much more subtle ways that we are affected by our prejudices, our lack of being able to see things clearly. There was a wonderful doctor when I worked at uh, the uh, Ottawa hospital who used to give lectures on self-awareness in a particular way. And he talked about cognitive distortions. He was a very well-known ICU doctor. And he said, patients die because doctors don't listen to other doctors. Doctors don't listen to nurses. Nurses don't listen to one another. Doctors and nurses don't listen to patients. And allied health may not be listening as well. He was very deadly serious about this workshop that he would give. And he had put it together with a psychologist from UCLA, actually, in California. And it was a different way of approaching uh, self-awareness that we do in spiritual care. But any, any form of trying to become aware of that which is somewhat unconscious, that we're not aware of, it comes into our sight and our peripheral vision psychologically. You start to see it spiritually. You start to see it, whether it's a matter of character or a matter of personality. As you're able to clean that mirror, you're able to have a better connection with your patients and they will experience you fully as a human being. And as they experience that caring and something of your confidence, a proper confidence, not an arrogance, that is very, very powerful, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a doctor, whether you're allied health. And it's where we start in the spiritual care profession. That's our base. That's our foundation. We go on from there only after we create that base, because without that rapport, that incredible deep rapport, everything else we do is not as effective. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Doug. My uh, 
other question is about uh, uh, about theological aspect of spiritual care and this is very important uh, for uh, spiritual care professionals or uh, in clinical pastoral education if we want to take admission so the prerequisites uh, one of the prerequisites is uh, masters in theology and we know that the theological issues we have in islamic uh, tradition in uh, we have islamic theology we have christian theology we have jewish theology so uh, uh, my experience is as a uh, i just i have phd in philosophy and theology so we have more theological theoretical side of theological issues and many of our theological aspects and then belief or whatever uh, they are not working in the bad side when we are providing spiritual care to our patients so they are not very much helpful what kind of uh, theology or theological foundation is required for providing spiritual care well we have persons of many different theological backgrounds many different religious backgrounds in the hospital and our interfaith spiritual care practitioners are able to relate to people of many different religions and the reason for that, I think, is partly because they are able to be open to people having their own experience, having their own frame of reference, and understanding that their job is not to try to change that frame of reference, but to work within it. That having been said, I think there's something very important that can be understood uh, that crosses all lines in terms of the cognitive and the emotional, the heart and the gut. And the head is very important. Uh, understanding wisdom uh, is very important. Being able to interpret things theologically is very important because say I have an illness and I come into the hospital and I think God is punishing me. And yet my friends and my family, everybody who knows me says, well, we don't see you as anything other than a decent human being who uh, goes to mosque, prays, etc., whatever it is. And, um, we don't see that you need to feel guilty. We think this illness has come about you because you caught a virus. It's a physical uh, issue. Still, there's going to be that guilt the person has. And how are you going to address that? Well, you can address that partly through looking at how are they thinking about that guilt? And what are the theological bases? And what does the Quran say? Or what does the Bible say? Or what does whichever religious book it is? What does it say about that? So that understanding of interpretation is very important. And I always say, err on the side of grace when you're interpreting something. Err on the side of grace because Allah is gracious, God is gracious. So that's one thing. The other thing is there's all sorts of subtleties as well underneath that. So there may be ways in which the person's guilt is trying to express that, you know, I know that there are some other things going on here. Maybe God didn't give me this illness, but there's some other things I want to look at in my life that are causing me, the illness is bringing them up for me. And years ago, I did something maybe I wasn't proud of, and this is just haunting me, and maybe it didn't cause my illness, but it's bothering me now, especially as I look at the possibility that I might be dying. So there's so many subtleties and different aspects that one can go this way or that way with, but attenuating to the head and the heart, because often, no matter what great interpretation you have of the Quran or of the Bible, if you do not have an understanding of the feelings that the person is going through, you will not be able to unlock this. They may hear everything you say up here, but if I'm still feeling guilty in here, well, that's not good. So I can address the guilt partly with the theological, but I also need to be able to address them with the rapport, with that imago day to imago day, to let them hear me with my use of self saying, well, maybe I don't know for sure exactly what it says in your particular religious book, for example. But I can tell you, as I hear you talk, I hear a man or a woman who is remorseful, who uh, feels that they would like to live their life differently. I hear someone who has loved and who hasn't loved perfectly, but who has loved. And for me, I can accept you. I can hear you. I can have empathy for you. Does your religious teaching not consider God to be empathetic? Does your religious teaching not consider God to be gracious? In your religious book, does it speak of forgiveness? Does it speak of acceptance? And by showing them that a human being made in the image of God can be there for them, not telling them what to believe, 
but asking them to be open to these things, a lot of things can start to shift and to move. And there's varying degrees of skill, of course, required as to how deep you go with this. Just like there's different skill uh, required to do an appendectomy or to do a brain surgery or open heart surgery. So everybody can do something by exercising kindness, openness, and ability to listen, to listen to the heart, speak, and just be there as a non-shaming, as a non-shaming, non-anxious presence so that you hear it. And that alone is a very, very powerful thing for people to start to sort their feelings so that their head and their heart can start to work together rather than one fighting the other or being out of sync with the other. Uh, Doug, if we move to uh, related to theology, uh, another aspect, which is, for example, challenges we may face uh, from theological point of view. For example, uh, there is a spiritual care provider who has a, a theological belief, which may be poisoning for uh, a patient. For example, he or she may believe that, yes, of course, this is a punishment of God, regardless of right and wrong. So we may consider it, consider it uh, maybe it's a big challenge for this person, how to provide spiritual care to this patient. So how you see overall challenges or theological challenges that we are facing uh, at the bedside? Well, it's a pretty broad question. I mean, <laughs> there's so many different challenges uh, that one can face. So I'm trying to interpret exactly what you're trying to uh, have me get at. Um, you know, when you meet a patient, one has to uh, start with the patient, not with oneself. So first of all, I wanna find out what is the worldview of the patient? Where are they coming from? First basics would be, are they Muslim? Are they Christian? Are they Jewish? Are they Hindu? Are they Buddhist? What are they? That's where I'm gonna start at the real big basics. And then from there, I'm gonna say, okay, well, what kind of Buddhist are you? What kind of Christian? What kind of Islamic uh, religion do you follow? Are you Sunni? Are you Shiite? Uh, are you some other branch of, of a religion? And then I wanna understand, okay, now in your particular family, how did you hold your Christianity? How did you hold your Islamic faith? How did you hold your Buddhist faith? What did it look like in your family? So we're getting smaller and smaller in terms of the particularities. And then eventually, how do you hold this particular faith? And how do you hold it in the context that you live in, which is the broader uh, church or Islamic community or Jewish community or Buddhist community? How do you hold it? How do you feel in reference to that? Because some people uh, who come into the hospital or Christians who are very conservative Christians from a very conservative background, the most effective way to help them is to go into the Bible with them and to find certain verses that will comfort them because it is not time for a lot of exploration. They have a surgery coming up. They don't need me to ask them a lot of questions or probe with them about their feelings about their family life. But the next person, it might be their palliative care and they need to do a full life review of how things have gone for them spiritually and emotionally throughout their life. If it's a surgical patient and they just need containment, if they're a conservative Christian, then I'm gonna help them look at the Bible and find some verses of comfort that says how God will take care of them, how God loves them and healing is in this world as well as the next world and whatever it takes to help them to get through that so they're not terrified going into surgery. A little bit of fear going into surgery, not so bad according to the studies actually may be healthy, but too much fear, feeling terrorized, you have more patients dying on the table. So all of these things I think are so contextual to the individual Nazir. And I think that is really the message that one needs to convey is to look at the large contextual issues, how they relate to the smaller, more micro issues in the family and what's going on in that individual. Because I can tell you there are many Christians carrying around heavy loads of guilt that according to the religious teachings of Christianity, they do not need to be carrying but they carry them anyways, because they really can't believe God is that good or trust God for God's grace as much as they need to. So I think you probably have these issues in Islam too, yes? And yeah. in all religions around the world. 
And so we have to say, what's the blockage? What's keeping the person from embracing that which their own religion teaches? And very often, it's not only some misunderstanding about something. Sometimes that's very important, a misunderstanding. But a lot of times, it's just, I can't forgive myself, or I can't accept myself, or I hate myself. And then you have to get into, again, whether it's containment or whether it's a situation of exploration, you have to get into trying to understand and relate to them on that level of their feelings to get them unstuck, if you will, so that they can move into the acceptance. How are you going to accept that God accepts you if you hate yourself? It's not going to work. So you have to look at what's causing you to hate yourself. How did that get set up? Where did that go off? And what can we do now? to talk about this. And one of the things is your use of self. You know, you seem like a likable, lovable person to me. You know, there's various different things that we can do to, to help. Yeah, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, my last question is about uh, spiritual care uh, for children. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, when we provide spiritual care to elderly people or elders, uh, there are some challenges and there are some techniques uh, so how uh, the difference is when we provide spiritual care to our kids and children and as compared to when we provide spiritual care to uh, elder people and uh, they are not child or they are not kids. And we know that uh, when we are providing spiritual care to children, their families are also involved. Their families are more in need uh, of spiritual care than children because they may not be able to interact with us. But sometimes directly we are able to interact with children as well and not with the family. So any significant aspect that you want to mention about uh, spiritual care for children? Sure. So let me begin by saying I think of the spiritual life cycle sort of like two funnels. Yeah. You know how a funnel is shaped. And when you come into the world, the funnel is wide. Then it yeah. narrows, it gets narrow, and then near as you get older, it widens out if you're doing your spiritual work. So I think children all over the world have this wide open, when they're small, wide open uh, access to God, access to Allah. Yeah. Uh, it's just innate uh, in them. And then as we get older, it starts to change. Now, Cavaletti in Italy actually studied this to, to show the amazing insight that children have into spirituality. And then really a lot older people, very wise people in all religious traditions share something in common, this wisdom that they have of the ages. With children, because they're so open, especially young children, one has to think about that, first of all, uh, in, in, in being with them. And in psychological terms, understand that this openness also creates a sense of magical thinking. So if you talk to psychologists, they'll talk about magical thinking with children. And to attend to that understanding that when you speak with them, they will take you much more literally and they will take you more at face value usually, unless they've got good reasons that they've learned, unfortunately, to mistrust at an early age. But in general, they will take an authority figure more at, at face value and are more likely to believe in a mystical, magical world. And so to give you an example, um, I had a friend actually who, at age five, his sister, who was three, died. Now, when he was in his 30s and 40s, he was still blaming himself for her death, even though he wasn't there. It was an illness. He did not give her this illness. He had nothing to do with this. Yeah. But somehow that little five-year-old mind that sinks magically uh, wanted to make sense of the world. And it was better to blame himself uh, than to blame something else. And he couldn't understand about germs and things like that. So to remember that they are magical in what they're thinking and that they're very open to the spiritual and that they're in touch with God, I think that's where it starts. We don't do a lot of work with children at Vancouver General. So it's not something that we specialize in. Our friends over at PHSA, they do. And they would have a lot more to say about that. But as a family therapist, because that's part of my background too, I would say working with the family, working with the parents, with the children also, you never want to neglect that because those parents are like gods to, to little children in particular. And then, of course, as the children get older, recognizing that they're transitioning through different stages, when they're adolescents, they're going through all kinds of changes and just being sensitive to that and acknowledging that they're in transition 
uh, I think uh, will go a long way to helping people to, to establish a better rapport with children and with, um, with people who are, are, um, are teenagers. And then of course, with the elderly, we wanna show a great amount of respect because you know they got there for a reason and uh, they deserve our respect. Okay, thank you so much, Doug. Um, thank you very much for your time and we really appreciate you. Uh, and we will be in touch with you. Thank you so much, so kind of you. Thank you very much. Let me say Hodafez, let me say Bedrood, and may God bless you and keep you and may you enjoy your experience with Nazir and expanding. So wonderful to see so many people in Mashhad and in Tehran uh, moving ahead with these uh, new uh, aspects of providing patient care. Uh, you clearly must care a lot about your patients to uh, be doing this uh, new venturing into another area. And as we come to understand the bio, psycho, social, spiritual model of care, uh, we start to see it. So it's all interconnected so that the word team starts to take on a whole new meaning uh, as we see the holistic care and what it truly means to, to work together for the good of others. So may God bless you in this work that you've been doing and that you continue to do. Thank you so much for your prayer and blessing. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now.